everyone. We are going to begin our program now. And I want to thank the Friends of the Library for supporting our program tonight. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Rick uh, Bloom as he is a partner, attorney, certified public accountant, and financial advisor at Bloom Advisors in Farmington Hills, Michigan. Rick has been coming to the Troy Library for many years, talking about all different topics on finances. Again, um, before I hand this over to Rick, please put your questions down at the bottom of the Q&A, and I'm going to give the screen over to Rick now. Well, thanks so much, and I first want to wish everyone a very happy, healthy, and prosperous New Year. It's hard to believe that it's 2022, and it's also hard to believe the uh, world that we live in today. You know, we don't live in the... Uh, the same world that we used to, everything is changing. We have to recognize and adapt to change. And that's why it's so important to take care of your personal financial affairs. It's easy to let them slide, but it's important that you don't. I mean, we've seen what's happened to our world over the last two years. Compound that if someone ran into a COVID problem and their personal financial affairs weren't in order that's where you really have problems. And yes, it is more complicated today. And it's not something that you could put in automatic pilot. However, comma, it's important to you, to your family, and to the future generations. So the topics we're going to talk about today are state planning, taxes, risk management, debt management, and investing. And what those are, are really the five pillars of personal finance. Every one of us, whether you are 80 years old and retired for 20 years, whether you're 60 years old, getting ready to retire in five years, whether you're 40, whether you're 20 and you're just starting out your career, it doesn't matter. These are the five things that you really need to look at and to make sure that you handle, because if you don't, it's going to cause you problems. And any one of these five areas can really uh, mess up your financial future. And sometimes when you mess that up, it's very difficult to correct it. So I also want to say that no matter what shape you're in financially and your personal financial affairs are, you can make them better tomorrow. You don't have to be great at everything right away. You can start the process but you will be better off by taking care of your personal financial affairs as opposed to just letting them sit there. I always describe personal finance, it's like a garden. You can have the most beautiful garden, but if you don't tend it, it's going to look pretty bad over a short period of time. And that's the same thing here with these areas. You may have some of these areas that say, yeah, I took care of it 10 years ago. Well, life has changed a lot. You want to make sure these areas are current. So the first area I want to talk about is estate planning. Now, this general perception is estate planning is for the wealthy and it's for the elderly. And that is absolutely not true. Estate planning is for everyone. Because you may not have money, but you have a, a minor child. So estate planning is important to you. Think about this. Our whole lives, we want to protect and take care of our families. Why is it that some of the most important times, family emergencies and death, that we forget about that? So estate planning is the area that we make sure that we know how to handle a family emergency, and we also know how to handle death. I also say this when it comes to estate planning. You know, there's really only one reason, and one reason at all you do estate planning. It's not to save on taxes. It's not to avoid probate. You know, let's face facts, when those happen, you're six feet under. The real reason why you do estate planning is because you love your family. It makes life easier for them when your affairs are in order. So I broke it down today into two different areas. While you're living 
and after death. While you're living, these are documents you need to protect yourself in case of a family emergency. And you also need to look at, you may have to have these for other loved ones. Because ultimately, one of the things that we want, we want to keep judges, courts, and lawyers out of family affairs. I'm a lawyer. I can tell you that. You don't want us involved in family affairs. Doing estate planning will prevent that. So the first thing that we have is while you're living. And there's two powers of attorney that I believe just about everyone needs. And a power of attorney gives someone the right to make decisions if you can't make it. And the first one is a medical power of attorney. The issue is if you can't handle your medical situation, whatever it is, who's going to make the decisions for you? Well, my belief is you don't want doctors making the decision. You don't want judges making the decision. You want people who know you and love you making those decisions. Well, unfortunately, that's not who always make the decision unless you put it in writing. And that's what medical powers of attorney do. Puts in writing who makes decisions for you if you can't make them. So there may be, you may have had an accident and you're in a coma and there's issues about what type of uh, care they should do. Well, you want the person that you believe will make the same decisions you would make based upon the facts. And that's what you put down in a medical power of attorney, a medical durable power of attorney. And it basically is who makes those decisions. And yes, you can also give someone the right to make the ultimate decision to uh, withdraw life support, deny life support, you know, things of that nature. But it's also, if you can't make a decision for whatever reason, if, allow them to get your medical records and get second opinions. Allow this person to talk to your doctors, talk to your caregivers, so they're more informed about your situation. You know, we live in a world where everyone's worried about being sued and people in the healthcare industry, they want to see these documents. That's why every adult needs a medical power of attorney. Husband should have one for wife and wife should have one for husband if they're the ones who should make the decision. But in addition, think about this. Those of you that have adult children that may not have a spouse or a significant other, who is the one who's going to make decisions? Who's the one who's going to have the right to look at medical powers of attorney? They're an adult. You don't have that right. So what you would have to do, and the same thing would apply for a wife who wants to make decisions for a husband who doesn't have a medical power of attorney, they would have to go to court. And they would have to have a judge decide whether they should get that power or not. It's expensive, it's time consuming, and it's a hassle. So parents, if you have adult children that are single, you may want to talk to them that they should give you a power of attorney. So if something happens to them, you can make the right medical decisions. You can be involved in the whole process. And that's why medical durable power of attorney is so important. Now, some of you may remember, we used to have something called living will. So a lot of people think, well, it's just as good. It's not. Living wills were meant to handle one thing, and that was one thing only, and that was life support. And the issue basically in a living will says, if I don't have a quality of life, I don't want to be around. That's what a living will said. The problem is it never defined what is a quality of life because it's so difficult to describe, and it's also personal to every person. So medical durable powers of attorney, they go one step further. You could have this provision in there. If I don't have a quality of life, I don't want to be around, but this is the person who I want to make the decision of whether I have a quality of life. 
So you're appointing the person who you want to make the decision. Medical powers of attorney are so critical, particularly in family crisis. And the nice thing about medical power, durable powers of attorney, you don't really have to go to an attorney to get one. There are lots of free forms. Michigan has one called the Michigan Patient Advocate form you can use, and they're just as good as just about any attorney can draft. The next power of attorney, oh, and I just should mention that medical durable power of attorneys are valid while you are living. Once you pass on, a medical durable power of attorney is no longer. Now, the next power of attorney is what we call a durable general power of attorney. And what that does, it covers everything that you want above and beyond health care. So, you can have someone give someone the right to, you know, handle your investments, to, you know, take care of your bills, deal with creditors, deal with debtors. You know, you give them all sorts of powers. So think about this. When you give someone a general durable power of attorney and a medical power of attorney, they basically are sitting in your shoes making the decisions that you want them to make without having to go to court, without having to account to a judge. It's an important position, but this is the, the person that you trust the most, that you think is going to do the best job. And remember, they don't have to have all the information because they could hire people to do certain things. They just have to be the one to, you think, will make the right decisions. Just like in a medical power of attorney, a general durable power of attorney terminates upon death. And again, there's this belief that a husband can make decisions for a wife and a wife can make decisions for her husband. That may have, be, may have been true in the 60s and the 70s. It's just not true in today's world. In today's world, spouses don't have that right. They can go to court and get it. But again, you're bringing judges and courts and lawyers into family affairs, which you don't want to do. So to protect yourselves, to make things easier, medical durable power attorneys and general durable power attorneys are essential for just about every adult in Michigan. If you have, if you have these powers, you haven't re-looked really at them in probably the last five years, you probably want to because things have changed. Now, another document that I think that everyone needs, and this is sort of a crossover document because it works for when you pass, but it also works from your living, and that's what's going to be called document locator. Think about if something happens to us. Would our loved ones know where things are located? How difficult would it be for them to find what we have? Would they be able to unlock your online presence? I don't know if you heard a story about, you know, uh, someone that passed on and supposedly they had like a hundred million dollars plus of Bitcoins and they can't find the codes. And so that money is gone and supposedly they will never get it back. Well, most of us don't have a hundred million, so we don't have to worry about that, but we have other things, you know, would someone know what your passwords are to get onto your online accounts? Would they know where you keep your tax returns? Would they know if you had a life insurance policy? Most of us, no way. So it's important that we have a document, a sort of a roadmap of what we have. You know, I have an account at Schwab, and this is my uh, account number. And it's important that it stays current. If you change your passwords, you have to show, change it on this document too. And you don't have to put dollar amounts, but you should say, I have a life insurance policy with Jackson National. It's a $100,000 life insurance. This is the policy number. You want to make it easier for people to find what you have so they can step into your shoes. Now, I don't think you should tell everyone in the world, you know, where this document is, only the person you trust the most. Something happens to you, they go there, and that's what gives them that roadmap. Good idea also on that, 
who you used as your attorney, if you used someone to help you with your taxes, you know, if you had an insurance professional. Again, it's to provide a roadmap. We've all heard stories about people that, you know, you hear about they used to have U.S. savings bonds and they lost them or this or that. Well, people lose money all the time because other people don't know where to locate it. So to make it easier on yourselves, do a document locator. Now, it's important that we look at what probate is. Now, probate is the process where if you have an asset that's either going to that um, that doesn't have a beneficiary attached, like uh, an account at Schwab or Fidelity, if there's no beneficiary and it's in your name, then that asset generally goes through probate, whether you have a will or not. Now, if you have a will, it makes the probate easier because the will tells you who gets that. If it's not, then the court has to go through its gyrations to uh, determine that. However, you know, you could avoid a lot of those, you know, going to courts, the probates, by having beneficiaries. Nowadays, there are so many things you could put beneficiaries on. When I first started my career, you could not put beneficiaries on things like mutual fund accounts. Now it's common. So it's important that you check you take this time of year that you go through and anything you have a beneficiary, make sure that you name someone. And people are always surprised. You know, they check their beneficiary and all of a sudden they, they see that an ex-spouse is named or a parent that passed away 10 years ago. And again, the beneficiary should be current based upon what you think today. So I would go through whatever you have, you know, bank accounts and brokerage houses, uh, your life insurance policies. You may have a life insurance policy you bought 30 years ago. You don't even remember who you had for your beneficiary. You may think you remember, but you don't. Check your beneficiary designations. Make sure they are accurate. They who you want today to get that money if you don't get it. And it's important. I would tell you that when you look at how much family situations change, um, it's important that whether it's once a year, once every couple of years, you check your beneficiary designations. And even nowadays, in the old days, we used to do quick claim deeds, you know, to pass houses to loved ones. And there was different ways of doing it. Well, now there's different methods to that as well. So it's a good idea to see whose name is on the deed on your house and what you want done. You may have something upon your death that uh, you can do what we call a ladybird deed. So it goes to whoever your beneficiaries are. So lots you can do with beneficiaries and they generally make life easier. However, where it doesn't make life easier, if you have the wrong beneficiary. I can almost assure you when, name, when you name an ex-spouse, they're going to claim, of course, he's, they still wanted me to get this money. It'll lead to a lawsuit. Whether you win or lose, you're going to lose something because you're going to have to pay the uh, lawyers. Now we want to talk about what you need to do to prepare for the ultimate. You know, one thing I'll guarantee you, eventually we're all going to leave this great world. That's just a fact of life. And assets that don't have beneficiary designations, who they go to is going to be based upon if you have, first of all, if you have a will or a trust or not. If you don't have a will or a trust, then what you're really saying is, I trust the state of Michigan to determine who should get my property. I don't want to say in it, I'll let the state of Michigan decide. Well, I would tell you this, bad move. You don't want the government making decisions for you. But that's exactly what you do when you don't do a will. 
Now, the will is the basic estate planning document. Again, there's many free wills. It's called, uh, one is the Michigan statutory will. And it basically, you could name who's going to be in charge of your estate, who gets your property, if you have children, who you want to be the guardians uh, and to raise your children. So wills take care of that. And again, everyone should make sure you have a will. However, what many people are doing these days is still doing a will just as a catch-all, but going into a trust. Now, it used to be people did trust to avoid estate taxes, but that's not as true as much anymore because the way the estate tax laws have changed. So what a trust is, is nothing more than a holding tank for your assets. So in my trust, I have all my mutual funds, I have my house, and everything I own basically is in the name of my trust. And the reason for that is, is if I can't handle my affairs, I have someone else, the trust has a mechanism, so someone come in and take care of my affairs. And when I die, they take care of my affairs based upon what I said in my trust. No court, no probate, no fuss. So that's why people use trusts. And you can do all sorts of things, that are, but you're in control of your money even after your death. Now, what's important to realize in a trust is there's different hats that need to be worn. So the first one is the set law. The set law is the individual who draws up the trust. They're the ones who are the only ones who can make changes to the trust. It's their trust. So on my trust, I'm obviously the set law. And on your trust, you'd be the set law. Those are, that's the only person that can make changes, basically. And you will be the set law even after your death. Now, the next person is the trustee. The trustee is the person in charge of running the trust. Well, eventually, when I die, someone's going to else have to be the trustee. But during my lifetime, I'm the trustee. So I'm the only one who can change the trust, and I'm the one who runs the trust. The third person in a trust is the beneficiary. That's the person who benefits from the trust. Well, during my lifetime, I am the only beneficiary. So I'm in charge of the trust. I'm the only one who can change the trust, and I'm the only one who can benefit from the trust. I'm in total control of my money. It's after my death, that someone comes in, happens to be my brother, follows the terms of the trust, distributes things, that's it, no court, no probate. So I would recommend that you look at your estate planning needs, think about, if, you know, if you haven't done a will and trust to really start looking at it, because this area is very important, especially in this crazy world that we live in today. Now, the next area I want to move to is taxes. Now, you see what it says here. Your goal is not to lower your taxes. And people think I'm nuts when they say that. Whenever I say that, you know, people like Snicker, oh, he really doesn't mean it. I do mean it. Your goal is not to lower your taxes. And I can prove it to you. Think about for those of you who are working. If you walked into work uh, tomorrow and the boss gave you a $100,000 bonus, you would turn it down if you want to lower your taxes because that's going to raise your taxes. That $100,000 gives you may cost you $25,000 in taxes. So if you want to lower your taxes, you wouldn't take the bonus. Someone recently won a half a billion dollars, $500 million on the lottery. Well, they probably had to pay a couple hundred million dollars in taxes. Well, if your goal is to lower your taxes, you don't want to win the lottery. I would love to win the lottery. I never play it, but I would love to win it. My focus always is what ends up in my pocket. So your goal is to increase your net worth. It's not to lower your taxes, and they don't go hand in hand. 
If you want to fool Americans, it's simple. Tell them you can lower their taxes and they'll run to you. Well, the best and easiest way to lower your taxes is to lose money. That really is. Because all these other things will just take more and more of your money because they're all get-rich-fast schemes. Now, taxes are a fact of our life. And it's not like I think that we shouldn't take advantage of tax laws to our benefit. So I always recommend that you don't make tax decisions based upon lowering your taxes. You make it based upon what's going to increase your net worth. Take advantage of the tax laws. For a lot of you, Roth IRAs, whether it's converting an existing IRA that you have to a, a Roth IRA, or if you're young, putting new money in a Roth IRA. Roth IRAs grow tax-free, and they're not subject to minimum required distributions. So um, take advantage of those tax laws. Maybe you've had a new grandchild, a new child, and you want to save for their college. You know, in the old days, people bought U.S. savings bonds. Well, today, you can go into a, a college savings plan, like the Michigan Education Savings Plan, and you can have money grow tax-free for that child's college education. So, you know, look at taking advantage of tax laws that work for you. Everyone's tax situation is different. Whenever you hear tax advice, you have to say to yourself, how that applies to me. Because your situation is unique. Whether you're itemizing your deductions or taking the standard deductions. But it is important that you look at taxes, you know, on a regular basis. You know, when you do different transactions, so that you can take advantage of the tax laws. But for most people, one of the greatest tax shelters there is, is to take advantage of Roth IRAs and at the same time, um, plans like the Michigan Education Savings Plan to save for a child's college education. Last thing about taxes, over the next few weeks, you're gonna start receiving tax information, 1099s, W-2s, it's important that you save those documents. They're important to preparing your tax return. Whether you do it yourself or hire someone, you want to make sure you give them all the information. And remember this, we are responsible for our own tax returns. Therefore, don't just hire anyone to do your tax returns. Make sure they have a commitment that they're staying current on our tax laws because our tax laws change faster than the weather in Michigan. The third area is risk management. Now, a lot of people like to call it insurance. No, insurance is a product. And it's one way that we handle risk. We do not insure all our risks. We accept certain risks. The example I always use is in the vaguest sense of the word, I play golf. I get more strokes per dollar than most people. That's how I describe my golf game. And I can assure you, when I play golf, I'm going to lose balls all the time. I never go around where I don't lose at least one ball. I don't have my golf balls insured. I can afford the buck a ball that it costs me. So I don't insure that. You, we have deductibles on our car insurance. You know, $1,000, you know, whatever it is that you have deductibles, well, you're assuming the risk. You know, if you buy a new pair of jeans and you ruin them, that's a risk you're assuming. So insurance is a product, and the goal of insurance is to manage those risks that you have. Now, it's important to look at your situation and see where you have risk. Most of us are going to have risks on our home and auto insurance, uh, our home and auto. And insurance is the one way that we cover that risk. Now, the question I have for you is, when's the last time you shopped around? When's the last time you had those insurances looked at? I mean, you know, home values have changed a lot. So you may find that your house is underinsured. You may find that things are overinsured or that you're not taking advantage of discounts. I think it's important that on a regular, regular basis, 
you review your home and auto insurance coverages, shop around and get competitive bids. That's one of the nice things about technology today is the fact that we have resources that we can check these things out. And what's also important is to make sure your coverages are up to date. I read a story not too long ago that a guy, his house was uh, destroyed. And the problem is he hadn't really changed his policy in 15 years. Well, they paid him on his policy, but in no way replaced the home. So it's important you look at your homes uh, and, and make sure the coverage is still current. Look at the values and shop it around to get competitive rates. The same thing with auto insurance. Uh, and one way to lower auto insurance is look at raising your deductibles. Now, I also want to say that it's a good time to go through your house and give your house a video inventory. God forbid something happened and there was a fire or something of that and your house was destroyed. Do you remember what you have? Can you recreate things? You know, we walk into our houses and things blend in, especially over the last couple of years since we've been home so much. Well, it's important you give yourself a video inventory. You know, use your phone and you can walk yourself through, you know, this is this, this is that. And then you save it in the cloud so that if something happens to your house, you have a video inventory with what you have. And video inventories are powerful tools. So if you haven't given yourself a video inventory, do it and talk your way through it. Life insurance. Does everyone need life insurance? I love these commercials that say, you know, you can buy a, a funeral policy for $50,000, something of that nature. I want to know whose funeral is paying $50,000, but that's besides the point. Not everyone needs life insurance. Yes, everyone is going to pass on, but that doesn't mean they need life insurance. The question you ask yourself, if you pass away, does anyone lose out financially? If no one loses out financially, you don't need life insurance. And my philosophy is if you don't need life insurance, look at getting rid of it. I see people all the time that they've had policies and they're paying on them for 20 years that they just don't need. And they know they don't need them. But it becomes routine. And the insurance companies love that. So what we need to do is to, first of all, take a look at and decide, do we need, is our death going to cause anyone to lose out financially? If it is, life insurance is a good way of handling it. Now, in many situations, you don't need life insurance for your whole life. You may need it until the kids are old enough to take care of themselves, something of that nature. That is why it's always important to also, when you buy life insurance, to look at term insurance. Term insurance is by far the least expensive type of insurance, and it's the one least sold. And there's a reason for that. And you know the reason, too. It doesn't pay a lot of commissions. You know, the whole lives, the variable universal lives, you know, whatever exotic name they come up with today, those pay good commissions. And those are the ones that offer free trips if the agents sell so much insurance. Term insurance isn't sold very much, but it's the best type because what you're paying for is what you need. You're buying a set amount of insurance for a set period of time. So you may say, you know, I'm in my 30s. My kids are, you know, five and six. Well, maybe you say I need insurance for 20 or 30 years. Well, you can then buy a term insurance policy for 20, 30 years. You could shop it around and get competitive bids. That's why I like term insurance, because it's easy to get competitive bids. And again, I would recommend look through your old policies. A lot of those policies, you know, you're just putting money in a sinkhole because what the expenses are and things of that nature. If you don't need it, look at ways of getting rid of it. Now, the next area is an area that I cannot tell you how important it is. And that's investing. You know, we all have to have 
a portfolio that we watch, take care of, that we have to really take care of ourselves. And no matter what age you're at, you have to think about your portfolio and investing. And I always say at the beginning of the year, it's a good time to go through the fundamentals. And the fundamentals is, you know, when it comes to investing, the question you have to ask yourself before you invest is what are my goal? What are my goals and objectives for that money? What am I trying to achieve for it? Now, the way most people invest is they invest based upon their age. Your age is immaterial. Your age doesn't say really a thing about you. I mean, someone says you're 60. So what? What does that mean? Well, it means that I can't afford to lose money. Well, neither can the 20-year-old. You know, there's some 60-year-olds that are retired. There's some 60-year-olds that want to work for another 20 years. There's some 60-year-olds that have kids, other that don't. You know, they try to throw us in these age groups based upon our age. Groups based upon our age doesn't make sense. We should invest based upon our goals and objectives. What are we trying to achieve with our money? Or maybe we're saving for grandkids' college education, which is 20 years away. Or maybe we're saving for a dream trip, which is five years away. Goals and objectives. You should know what that is. And really what the key is, is the time frame you have to achieve those goals. And remember, if you say, well, I'm five years away from retirement, well, what does that mean? The issue is, well, do you need, you know, what are your resources? How much are you going to need in retirement? Because remember, just because you're retiring at 65, that doesn't mean that life's over. You could easily be around another 30 years from now. And think about during that 30 years, how much things are going to cost. You go back 30 years ago now, and you say, you know, 1992, we were still getting those uh, free AOL discs in the, in the paper, 100 free hours or something of that nature. Fast forward today, we have a significant bill for the uh, internet. Things change and you have to have a rising income in today's world. So someone who's 65, of course, needs a portion of his portfolio in growth. But you invest based upon your goals and objectives. You do not invest based upon your age. Your age says nothing about how you should invest. I don't have a portfolio for a 65-year-old. The portfolios that we manage, I don't have a portfolio for a 70-year-old. I don't know what to do with a 40-year-old. I mean, you look at individuals, you build portfolios based upon their individual goals and objectives and their unique situations. That's what you need to do. Two, it's important that before you invest, you understand risk. And there's this view in our society that one, risk is the stock market goes up and down. That's aggressive. And CDs, because they don't go up and down, they are risk-free. Nothing can be further from the truth. Let me tell you, there is no such thing as a risk-free investment. It just doesn't exist. Every investment has risks, and it's important to identify that risk, make sure you're willing to assume it, but also to make sure in being diversified that not all your eggs in one, are in one basket with the same risk. So you say, well, how can a CD be risky? Because if I put money in, I'm going to get it back from the bank. And yes, you will. You'll get that money back. However, it's not going to be worth as much. You know, when you look at money in the bank that's getting a half a percent, you pay tax on that. And then you say, well, is my cost of living going up more than a half percent a year? It sure is. So it doesn't look, it doesn't really make much difference over a year, but you go five and 10 years, it's incredible. You know, if we were in a group, I, I asked a lot of people at seminars I give, how many people are driving a car more expensive than their first house? And a fair number of people raise their hands. That shows you time value of money. Money erodes in value over time. I remember that $100 in 
that bought a lot. Today, I can't get it out of Costco without spending $200. And I didn't think I'd bought anything. So you have to have this rising income throughout your life. And investing in CDs are not going to do that. Stock market is not aggressive if you're talking 10, 15 years down the road. If you're talking 10 weeks down the road, the stock market's aggressive. CDs are not aggressive if you're talking six months, a year down the road. But they're very aggressive if you're talking 10 years down the road because they're not going to keep up with the time value of money. So it's important to recognize there's no such thing as risk-free investments. When people tell you, you hear these commercials sometimes, oh, you can invest with us and there's no risk, run. That's what Bernie Madoff used to say. Oh, there's no risk when you invest with me. There is risk in every investment. And what you have to do as an investor is to look at what sort of risk you feel comfortable with. Stock market, if you look at it every day, it can cause people problems. If you look at it over long periods of time, it doesn't really cause any issues. So, you know, you have to look at the type of investor you are. Lastly, when it comes to investing, you need to make sure your portfolio is allocated correctly. All the studies show you want to be a successful investor, have the right allocations. You know, having the right allocations to me is like packing for a vacation before you know where you're going. You may get lucky when you get to your location that you pack right, but maybe you didn't. Think about it. If I was going to Alaska now, I wouldn't need my golf clubs. But if I was going to Florida now, I would need my golf clubs. So think of the golf clubs are like your investment. It really doesn't matter what the uh, investment is. It's whether it's achieving your goal and whether you're allocated properly. It's important that you look at your portfolio and make sure it's properly aligned. And you need to do that at least twice a year to make sure you stay in balance. Because when your portfolio gets out of balance, it's sort of like, your guard and not being taken care of. It's going to cause you problems. And a lot of people, the reason why they don't rechange the allocations in their portfolio is because they don't want to pay taxes. Because you know what you need to do when you rebalance your portfolio? You need to sell winners and buy losers. And people look at that, are you nuts? Well, the way you make money in the market is to buy low and sell high. That means you buy things that are down and you sell them when they're high. So if you wanna be successful as an investor, you need to make sure you have the proper allocations. Now, the last area um, I wanna talk about is debt management. You know, I remember when I got my first charge card. I had to go talk to the banker about whether I should get a charge card or not. He went through it with me the whole bit. Today, I can go on my phone in 10 minutes, probably not me, but others can, probably can apply for 10 charge cards. You can get personal loans now online. It is so easy to get in trouble with debt. It's important that we manage our debt. And in doing that, one, we want to recognize that not all debt is the same. A 3% mortgage in your house is a lot different than an 18.5% you know, interest rate on your charge card. So it's important that you look at your debt, you look at it from the interest rate, you look at it from you know, when it's due, and you have a strategy about paying it off. Debt is not good other than in the home, as long as your home doesn't own you. Charge card debt, you should do whatever you can to extinguish it because it'll erode at you. It will eat at you. The average charge card debt in this country is 18.5% non-tax deductible. It just doesn't make sense. So it's so important that you look at your debts and look for ways of reducing them. And I think when you have extra money to pay off your debt, what you first need to do is pay off the debt that has the highest interest rate. Some people say you do it with the highest balance. I say you do it with the highest interest rate because if you have an 18.5% uh, 
interest rate, when you pay that down, you're getting 18.5% return on your money. And that's a, uh, a great return. So that went through the basics, which we all need to do to make sure that we keep our financial house in order. So at this point, Maggie, I want to uh, make sure we leave time for some uh, questions. Okay, uh, let's look in the, I see one in the chat. Um, are there free forms of do, uh, durable power of attorney? There are some free forms, yes. Um, different law firms sometimes have it posted. There's not one through the state, but uh, uh, I'd also go to the website of the State Bar of Michigan, and they used to have some forms. And here's another one. Uh, if you want to leave your car to someone specific, how do you go about doing that? Well, what I would look at doing is I would put that in my, if, if I was having a trust, I'd put that on my trust. Who gets that, uh, that car? If I had a will, I would put it in the will. That Now, you have to, one thing you have to keep in mind is that car may change over the years. So you either have, if you name a specific car, you're going to have to redo the will every time you change the car. Or what you could do is if you say, well, it's the car I'm currently driving, you know, the car I currently own, you know, uh, you know, then it makes it much easier. Okay, the next question is uh, risk management. Noticed uh, no one mentioned umbrella liability insurance. I have one team driver with another this summer. What is your opinion of umbrella insurance? Are there any rules of thumb for coverage? Well, first of all, I would say, first of all, good luck for having two, two team drivers at the same time. Um, a lot of patience there. Um, first of all, let me tell you what umbrella liability insurance is. It covers you above and beyond what your auto and your homeowner's insurance cover you for. And typically it's sold in million dollar increments. I have no problem with umbrella liability insurance. And I think people that are business owners and have large portfolios, it makes sense to have it. It is very inexpensive coverage for what you get. And, you know, if you bundle your policies, generally your homeowners and ours with the same company, they also give you discounts on your uh, umbrella coverage. So I, I think they are good ideas, particularly, you know, business owners or, or someone with assets, you know, it makes sense to have it. Okay, there, there was a second question on uh, what do you think of umbrella and policy? And you no, I like those uh, uh, umbrella policies. I think they're important and I think people should uh, take advantage of them. Uh, what's the best way to keep current with tax laws? Um, become a tax attorney. <laughs> um, it is hard. It is very difficult to stay current with taxes because so much changes on it. Now, I would tell you, that for most people, they don't need to stay current with every little nuance on tax law. The IRS's website, surprising that it is, irs.gov, is very good and very user-friendly uh, about tax law and tax law changes. So I'd recommend uh, the IRS's website. Now, I'd also tell you this about tax laws. Don't believe what your next door neighbor tells you because most people don't know what our tax law says. It's what they think it says that they say, or they say, oh, this is gonna be in the new law. No one knows that stuff. And so I think the irs.gov is a really good starting point to keep current uh, about taxes. Okay, here, here's another question. Uh, can a 401k Roth savings essentially act as a life insurance policy in the event the owner dies before they are eligible to access these funds at 59 and a half? Well, first of all, you know, you'd have to look at the dollar amount. I mean, um, so yes, yeah, someone can inherit that money and uh, there's different ways of taking that money. They can take it out in lump sums and even under 50, if 
the beneficiaries under 59 and a half so they can get that money currently and use it for their uh, expenses. So you'd have to look at the dollar amount. A lot of times you can buy much greater amounts of, uh, you know, a term life insurance policy than you would accumulate in your, uh, you know, 401k. But I love the fact, by the way, that you're using a, uh, a Roth 401k. I think that makes a lot of sense. I'll just keep this in mind, the back of your mind, that when you turn 72, assume you're retired, you know, before that, you want to move that money into a Roth IRA because our tax law is a little quirky. Even though you're not required to take out money in a uh, 401- in a Roth IRA, you do have to take it out of a Roth 401k when you turn 72. So generally, you know, when someone gets about 70, that's when I always remind them it's a good idea to transfer that to a Roth IRA so you preserve the idea that you don't have to take that money out for any minimum required distribution. Okay. Um, could you please talk a little bit about charitable trusts? Thanks. Okay. What's been very popular is these charitable advised tr uh, donor trusts. And Fidelity and Schwab and Vanguard have them. They're known as gift trusts. And what that is, is Let's say you want to give money to a charity or charities, and you just don't know which charity you want to give in, but you know you want to take the tax write-off. And you want to give appreciated securities so that you can avoid the tax on those. So what happens, you could set up a donor-advised charity uh, trust with a Fidelity or Schwab, transfer those securities in the trust. By doing that, you avoid paying any taxes on that. You get a charitable contribution for the full fair market value of the uh, security that you put in, and you get the tax deduction currently. Then you could take your time and dole that money out to individual charities over you know the rest of your life. You know, so you get the deduction currently, but you don't, and you leave it in the trust. You you could manage it, but Eventually, when you distribute it, it goes to a charity. You don't get another charitable contribution uh, at that point in time. So where it is, a lot of people use it, especially the way the market has done recently, is they use appreciated securities to put into those uh, charitable donor advised trusts so that they avoid the tax on that gain. Now, you can say, well, why don't you just write the check to the charity? Well, again, when you write a check to the charity, and if you, you know, you don't get that double tax benefit by if you donate a security where you can avoid the capital gains tax on it. And here it lets you break it up into many different charities. So those have become very popular and people that are charitable in nature certainly should look at them. Okay, and next question. Uh, if I have a will that covers beneficiaries, then do I still need a trust? Well, you potentially will because the will is going to go through probate. And if you have, you know, substantial assets, you'd want to do a trust so you avoid the probate process. And um, that's the way I look at it is um, probate can get expensive, it gets time consuming, and sometimes it pits family against families unnecessarily. So at the same time, if you uh, had a trust, you avoid that and you name the person in charge, they're in charge, they follow what you want. So yes, uh, there's a lot of reasons why someone with a will would want to look at a trust. Uh, when does a Roth conversion make sense? Uh, well, I, I think there's a few things that you look at. One, you want to make sure by converting, let me talk about for a second, take a step back. When you convert money, you're taking money out of your traditional IRA, you pay the tax on it, and then you put it into the Roth IRA. Now, the first rule I have is by doing it, you don't want to throw yourself into a higher tax bracket. That doesn't make sense. Two, you have to have the money to pay the tax without touching the money that you are converting. And three, you can leave it there at least five to seven years. 
If you meet those three criteria, then it makes sense to convert to a Roth. Now, the benefit of converting to a Roth is that money no longer grows tax deferred. It now grows tax free. You never have to pay tax on any of that money as it grows. In addition, there is no minimum required distribution at age 72. You can let that money grow tax free for as long as you want. And then when your loved ones get the money, they're going to pay no income tax on it. So there's a lot of really good reasons to do uh, Roth IRA conversions. But the key is you don't want it th to throw you into a higher tax bracket. Okay, uh, here's another question on converting. It says, is it worth it to convert a 401k to Roth? How much a year? Well, that depends upon your own individual situation. but. I think it does as long as you can do enough to uh, that you keep yourself in the same tax bracket that you're currently in and that you have the money to pay the tax without uh, uh, touching the money converted. You know, one of the nice things about having a Roth that grows tax free is that it gives you a lot of flexibility down the road. You know, when you talk to people in their 70s, you know, a lot of them, they don't want to take out of their IRA. They would be very happy if they could leave it there, but they can't. So having a Roth gives you a lot of flexibility. Okay, it says, I'm turning 72 this year. Should I take the RMD this year instead of March um, 2023 or take two distributions in 2023? I generally don't like to take advantage of that loophole by taking it out of April 1st of the year after you turn 72. And the reason is because you double, you do take a double distribution in, you know, um, in that year, and that can cause you to go into a higher tax bracket. It can cause some other issues, depending upon what your income is. It could throw you into where you're paying that premium for uh, Medicare B. So I generally would prefer that people take it out at 72. Now, if for some reason at, you know, when, they, when they're 70, the year they turn 73, they're taking the money out and, you know, they're going to be in a much lower tax bracket. Yeah, that may make sense to defer. But in most cases, I, I would take it at 72. Okay. Do you need to hire an attorney for a living trust? Do you rec any, uh, recommend any such software products? You know, um, you don't necessarily need an attorney. I generally would recommend one because in a trust, there's a lot of different moving parts. and There's a lot of things that you can do. And I don't know, um, you know, how much the software can do some of those issues. Um, I don't know which software I would recommend because they change so fast. And so I, I'm going to defer on that question. But you don't, if you're going to do it, I, I think it does pay to use an attorney so that they can ask you the right questions. And, and I think that that's what a good estate planning attorney does more than anything is listen to what you say and then come up with different scenarios so that your estate plan reflects what you want. Not what 98% of the other people want, but what you want and what's unique to you. Okay, uh, this question is, I own a 15% dividend ETF, Cornerstone Strategic Value Fund. Am I crazy to keep it if the interest rates keep going up? Well, it's going to be an aggressive... Uh, uh, I'm not familiar enough with that ETF, but I, I know enough that it is on the aggressive side. And uh, I think if we have spiking interest rates, yeah, it's going to take a significant hit. I think that if interest rates are, the increases are more moderate, I think it'll be a little different. But if we have, uh, you know, jolting high interest rates where they raise them at 1% at once, something of that nature, that fund will take a hit. Okay, here's a risk management question. Long-term care insurance seems to be very expensive and a bit wild uh, West business with few companies to choose from. 
Are there any other strategies to consider for long-term care expenses? First of all, you are 100% right. It is the Wild West. It's expensive. A lot of the good companies have gotten out of the business. Uh, Long-term care is a really tough, tough area. It's one of the hardest areas I deal with. I think what hopefully people do is invest their money wisely so they can be self-insured. Uh, you know, my problem with most long-term care is it just doesn't pay off. So the strategy I use for people who are going to say, I still want to buy something, is that as opposed to, you know, doing what most people do, they'll buy a long-term care policy with a 90-day, um, what we call waiting period. And that means you have to be in the facility basically for 90 days before they start covering you and whatever that coverage is. Well, what I tell a lot of people to do is they should be self-insured for really the first year because your premiums go way down. You know, just like your deductible and your car go down. Remember when it was a hundred dollar deductible? Imagine what a hundred dollar deductible would cost your insurance today. So look at ways of increasing your, uh, your premium, your, um, your waiting period and to see how the premium goes down. But on the whole, that's why I encourage people to invest, is that they'll have the resources to take care of themselves. Now, what I've also done, you know, for people in certain situations, I've recommended reverse mortgages that um, they needed assistance. Um, We did a reverse mortgage and they're using the money from the reverse mortgage to pay for full time aides to assist them. So it's another way to pay for long-term care is through a vehicle like a uh, a reverse mortgage. Uh, Where is a good uh, place to invest RMD if I don't need the money? Well, okay. So that happens to a lot of people. Well, I would say I'd put it right back into your portfolio. You know, I'd invest it outside, you know, of an IRA. So if you look at your portfolio and, you know, look at how it's balanced, um, you know, especially so you're, you know, uh, you can be around a long term, you want to make sure you have a growth mode in the portfolio. If you don't have anything in the growth area, I think a great fund to start with is like the Vanguard Index 500 fund. It's a, a commission free fund and the money, you know, is just been a good solid long term fund. But I think, you know, again, uh, people need to always look at um, what is their goal for that money. If the goal is shorter term and you're at Vanguard, you know, look at something like Vanguard Wellesley Income, which is a much more um, shorter term based fund than an index 500 fund. Uh, Which is advisable uh, investing in a 401? one Roth or a Roth IRA for the investments beyond the company match? Well, what I would look at is, assuming you qualify for both, I would see on the the Roth 401k, you know, what investment options, what are the costs? All things being equal, I'd go into the Roth IRA because you have more flexibility on that. You're in more control than on your uh, 401. Because if the owner decides to change the plan, things of that nature, you can be hindered. Now, the other thing that the one advantage of using a Roth 401 versus an IRA is you can borrow money from your 401k. That's something I never recommend. It has to be the very last option. But uh, all things being equal, yeah, I'd rather go into a Roth IRA so I'm in control of my money. I have a lot more investment options. Um, and I can make sure I have some low cost, good investments. If uh, we start a college plan 529 in Michigan, and if we relocate to some other state, is it transferable? Well, I would tell you, you know, it is transferable, but you don't generally have to worry about that because one of the beauties of the Michigan Education Savings Plan it basically can be used for any public or private institution in the country. So if I'm making this up, you moved to Indiana and your daughter was going to University of Indiana, 
you can use the uh, your money from your MESP at the University of Indiana. There's no problem with that. Um, but it, you know, generally you can transfer it to another 529. But again, one of the beauties of the Michigan Education Savings Plan is not only that it can be very, it's a low cost plan, low minimum, only takes $25 to invest, but basically it's not limited to uh, Michigan schools. And just remember on the Michigan Education Savings Plans, there are a couple different ways of, pay, of buying it. You can go through uh, an advisor or a broker, or you can go direct. Well, to me, I'd rather go direct to save the commissions. You're getting the same thing, so um, think about that if you're buying the Michigan Education Savings Plan, misaves.com. Are managed funds such as at Fidelity worth the fees? Well, some of them are. I would tell you to look at a fund like Fidelity Contra Fund and how well that has done over the years. Um, the majority of managed funds, you know, underperform their index. However, the index is not what they manage to. Um, indexes assume you're 100% invested at all times, where a managed fund, you know, may say, you know, it's too risky. We may only want to invest 80% of our money. So there's sometimes different risk levels. In a down market, managed funds generally do better because the manager has more flexibility. So over the last few years in an up market, yeah, indexes have performed well, but I think it's important in a portfolio to still have uh, managers that can make decisions, um, just not by the computer. So I think you have to look for the good funds. And one of the ways I always would tell you to look is always look for funds that have low costs. Low costs equal higher returns. You know, a lot of times you have a good manager, but the fund is so high in cost, it just erodes the return. So always look for low cost investments and, you know, the world has finally adopted the idea that commission-free makes sense. Uh, for HDHP high deductible insurance plan, is it worth to keep the extra money as emergency or worth to invest in mutual funds for value beyond 1K? Well, if I didn't need that money, I'd say, why not invest it? Um, because the idea is if you just leave it like in the cash count, um, the money's eroding in value because we all know inflation is here and it's going to be with us for a while. And so, um, and we know that healthcare inflation is probably higher than anything. So yeah, I'd, if I knew I wasn't going to need it, I'd rather invest it. Uh, is it too late to convert a 401k to a Roth IRA for 2021 tax year? Is the yes. rule the conversion must be done in the calendar year for that year's taxes? Yes. So it is too late. Now, it's not too late to contribute new money to a, a, a Roth IRA. If you qualified for um, a new contribution, you can do that up through, I think, this year, April 18th. Um, and uh, still get the deduction, but um, you can't do a, a conversion now. It is calendar year. But there's nothing to say you can't do a 2022 conversion now. And a lot of people wait till the end of the year to do it. It doesn't make sense. You do it now, you're an extra year, the money growing tax-free. Okay, it uh, looks like this is the last question, unless a couple more come in. I turned 72 in December and our, uh, to receive my first 401k distribution in March. Is it too late to convert it to a Roth IRA? Well, no, it is too late for that distribution. However, you can convert anything above and beyond that number. So, yeah, that distribution, no. But you still have time to convert your distribution that you, your normal distribution in this year. So um, not on the first one, but all future, you can start doing conversions. And it may make sense, it makes sense for a lot of people to convert, you know, a little every year, uh, keep them in the same tax bracket, things of that nature. Okay, are there, oh, here's one more question. 
What is a good option for conservatively investing money currently in regular saving accounts for a senior individual who doesn't need the cash right now? Well, I would ask, when do you need the cash? If you're talking about needing the cash over the next year, I would tell you I wouldn't do anything but CDs. I think markets can be volatile. And, you know, when you buy a CD these days, you need to shop it around. And you can go online and look at uh, internet banks. As long as they're federally insured, you're fine. Now, if you said, you know, I won't need it for at least, let's say, three, five years, something of that nature, then I would start, you know, look at investing. And I would have, you know, maybe like a 55% stock equity portfolio, 45% fixed income. So depending upon what you have, you could stay diversified. Now, if it's just not a large sum of money, you know, a good fund that you can look at is a balanced fund. A balanced fund is investing in stocks and bonds. Um, you know, Vanguard has a, a, a you know a couple of good balanced funds. You know, Vanguard Wellington, uh, Vanguard Wellesley would qualify that. Dodge and Cox balanced fund is, is another good one. So uh, depending upon when I needed that money. So, you know, if you're looking for just one fund, you know, and you're at least three to five years, look at one of those. Dodge and Cox balance, Vanguard Wellesley, Vanguard Wellington. If you're talking shorter term, I think you really need to keep it in CDs because it's too risky to chase the higher returns in this environment. Okay. Um, just a, thank you so much from someone. Um, I guess that's it on the questions. Any, any other questions before um, we close for tonight? Um, oh, I see one more here. And... Well, that was, that was just the thank you. So I think we're all finished, Rick. Well, then I want to say thank you. Thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity. And thank you for those of you who are here today for giving me the opportunity to talk with you. Uh, I want to wish everyone a very happy, healthy, and a prosperous new year. And to encourage you to get involved with your, your finances. I always tell people, getting involved with your personal finances is the only hobby I know of that you can actually make money as opposed to costing you money. And it's important for you, it's important for your family. So the first step is always the hardest, but over a short period of time, you could really accomplish a lot. So thank you so much for uh, having me. Oh, one, one other question came in, Rick. Should a house be in a trust? Well, you know, I, I think it generally makes sense to do that. So that upon death, your house doesn't have to go through a probate process. You own your house during your lifetime. And then whoever you want takes over, takes over only after your death. You run into a lot of problems that do, people that do quit claim deeds. They record the quit claim deed. And they don't realize that they've actually transferred ownership. And you have all sorts of family dynamics that enter into that. You transfer it to the trust. You're the trustee, you're the set lawyer, you're the beneficiary, you own your house, you have total control over it, and it only passes upon your death. So thanks again, Rick. And uh, thank when you, you. Need, all right, thank you.